bad. Okay, so um, the request here was to hear some about our work with uh, particle filtering and particle MCMC for um, uh, for COVID nineteen. And uh, as I've mentioned, uh, this work has uh, been supported by diverse contracts uh, from around the the country, and um, it was actually rendered into uh, to a to a production processing pipeline that um, some of those uh, I believe here right now um, uh, help help support. So um, uh, Luja Duan was particularly key, but uh, Eric Redekop played an important role, Vion Patel, um, as well as a, a set of others. Um, the real heroes of this work are additionally uh, Sha Yan here um, uh, with support from one of, one of her daughters here and and uh, who is being stalked before the pandemic by a strawberry, um, and in the broader lab, which was uh, seconded. Um, uh, Jeremy Ong played a, a key role in some of the, um, the particle MCMC work. Uh, Xiao Yan um, in supporting the development of the particle filtering model together with me and, and uh, Lu Jie Duan, and then a set of others who, who supported this work in terms of service delivery. Um, in an exemplary fashion. Um, uh, I, I'm not commenting on the heroic role played by others in our group. Um, this was taken just pre-pandemic, um, such as Yuan here uh, leading um, hybrid modeling to inform capacity planning for the province. Wade's um, uh, spectacular role in building uh, agent-based and hybrid models that are used to this day and in our province and in Australia uh, for decision-making um, and contributions from uh, Bryce, um, uh, from Alex here, uh, and uh, early on from Winchell and Chin Yang um, here as well. Leah uh, here is now working uh, for the province uh, with these models um, as well, and others uh, contributed in, in some limited fashion too. So much of our lab was seconded with me. and. What came of this was a production processing pipeline that um, that used our particle filter and now can support particle MCMC models for daily data ingestion, pre-processing scripting to sort of deal with data quality issues and, and clean the data and prepare it for, for use in particle filtering. Um, uh, and and then execution of the particle filtering via distributed computation. So it was running on a bunch of different machines, some of which were purchased by the province for us, others of which were um, university machines, um, some provided by FNIB as part of that contract. Um, and uh, and the, the particle filter would run for most of a day with the new data that came in each day. So we had a distinction between uh, full empirical span runs so would run over the entire observed period and would take much longer than a day. Um, and then runs of about a day, which would uh, uh, advance the particle filtering given the, the new data that came in for that day, be it wastewater data and, um, and health system data. Uh, and uh, following that run, they there would be post-processing that would process the results of it, render it into our uh, using our scripts, render it into reports, um, which would be sent out via email or uploaded to, um, uh, to PHAC's uh, site for each of the provinces, et cetera. Um, and uh, there's quite sophisticated mechanisms here for sort of logging what was going on and, and accumulating the metadata um, and mechanisms for debugging, figuring out if something went wrong. It was a very reliable process, but you know, occasionally there'd be uh, a problem which would come up and we would need to, to go in and figure out what's going on. And, and we had a, a sort of a, an audit trail that was capturing, um, um, capturing sort of a picture of, of what was going on in this context. Now, the, the actual models um, uh, were, were used for a number of, of purposes. And you've seen some of these graphs before, you know, I, I kind of like to think of them as having provided population tomography, sort of uh, um, from multiple different types of angles, providing a glimpse of what's going on in different areas of the system. Um, and indeed, some of our earlier graphs 
have exactly that flavor. Um, so we actually had a dashboard for this model um, with which Cheyenne and I spent inordinate amounts of early time. Um, gradually, this got supplanted by, by the R-based scripts, et cetera, whereby we would be judging model output against empirical data from diverse sort of points in the model. So the idea is, you know, we, we have this model and I should show you a picture of at least its earlier version. This was from the, the you know, just less than six months into the model creation. So it was simpler there. It didn't have vaccination, didn't have waning of immunity, et cetera. But this is what it looked like in summer 2020. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, of course, each particle has, has a value for each of these, these stocks at a given time. We've talked about that in this boot camp. And, um, you know, key interest would be in summarizing what the, what the particle filter overall thinks, what, what its distribution is for a number of people in this stock or this stock or this stock or, you know, this compartment or whatever and comparing that with empirical data. Um, and uh, that was possible because many of these could be related to, uh, to empirical data. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, those are some, some early, early findings. So, you know, we had a lot of attention early on in travel related cases, um, which were just parameterized uh, into the model and then we, made uh, some assumptions that was of great importance in March, 2020 and in April, 2020, when we, we were starting out and we really needed to, to get it right in order to capture the dynamics that were observed. Um, um, the model built in a representation of testing um, uh, that, that was quite nuanced and I think it's underappreciated. Um, um, testing data we found in, particularly in certain areas of the pandemic, certain timeframes of the pandemic, to be key for interpreting case counts. Now, that may sound odd because most modeling ignores testing levels, but uh, we found for jurisdictions we are working with big differences in testing. You know, when a when a active case finding strategy was undertaken, when uh, contact tracing was ramped up, when um, major drive-in testing sites were rolled out or discontinued or what have you, it really affected the, the reported case count. If you're not beating the bushes, you're gonna find fewer people through active case finding. But meanwhile, there are some other types of individuals, particularly individuals with serious symptomology that are gonna come in in any case. And um, um, you know, we found in order to distinguish genuine shifts in underlying epidemiology, how many people are really sick out there from um, the vagaries of what happens to be reported, who happens to be found today versus yesterday. Um, we really needed to, to reason about, about test, test volumes. Um, we, could do we could do a considerably better job with test volumes than we could without. And yet the, there's a bi-directional relationship or a reciprocal relationship between testing and epidemiology. Um, changes in testing naturally by alerting people to their infection status cause awareness that can lead people to isolate, for example, um, and can allow others who have been exposed to them to quarantine um, to find out if they end up getting infected. But meanwhile, epidemiology changes, um, changes in the burden in the population um, would drive testing often. Now, um, uh, some of that testing that was driven by epidemiology change was, um, uh, was more elective and others was more uh, obligatory, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So really we, we characterize two types of test, test, test uses. One is through active case finding and one is through passive case finding. Passive case finding is, um, the, the terminology is kind of from the, the perspective of the health system, unfortunately. Passive case finding is the, the health system is passive. It doesn't have to do anything. People come in, Th they present for care. Um, uh, active case finding is going out and running, running contact tracing mechanisms, 
or engaging in door-to-door -door screening or what have you, which would go on. And, um, uh, and we, we, we captured those distinctions. Now for passive case finding, there are two types we recognized in the model. There's obligatory um, case finding or obligate case finding, which is driven by serious cases. I mean, if somebody is short of breath or somebody has a really, really high fever, um, uh, someone has acute chest pain, um, they're very, very likely to come in for testing no matter what you do. You don't have to, you know, unveil upon them to come in for testing in Canada. Maybe in the US with, with underdocumented, you know, with un, un, uh, uninsured populations of undocumented immigrants and so on, this is less of a given. And indeed, there are tragic cases of, of lower SES populations, um, vulnerable populations in the US of, of individuals dying at home. But in Canada, um, with, with um, the care involving no cost barrier, um, uh, people would come in for testing typically if they had the severe symptomology. But some individuals would present for care electively, you know, as part of civic duty, right? They, they uh, feel sick, they have, uh, uh, they have a modest fever, they have um, uh, coughing, and uh, they want to make sure they don't infect others, and they want to make sure, you know, they're not going to go to work and infect people or infect family members. And there's a sense of family or, or civic responsibility to go in and, and getting testing. And, and that tends to be much more fungible, much more variable, because, um, you know, it depends on on um, uh, awareness raising on the part of the health system, et cetera, as to how, how much people will go in, the degree, their perception about waiting times, stigma, um, a big area we, we do, we focus on for a lot of our work and particularly important for, for, um, for uh, stigmatized populations. Um, and uh, so we reasoned in our model about distinction between passive and active case finding. And for passive case finding, we distinguish these two types where elective was driven by uh, more uncertainty, think random walk, um, uh, and obligatory was more or less given. If somebody was, had developed severe symptomology, they, they would go in. Um, and, and that affected different flows in the network. The flows into the hospital were taken as given. You know, th that wouldn't be subjected to sort of random walks in, in presentation levels. Whereas the other ones would, uh, there would be a random walk and a parameter between two, two different levels for presentation. And that was informed by the literature about, you know, the fraction of infectives who, who actually get noticed, the ascertainment rate basically. Um, so we had obligatory and, and uh, elective presentation. Um, these were components put into effect, I think maybe in May or June, 2020, something like that. Um, probably maybe, maybe they reached fruition in June um, and we're really undergoing testing by then. Um, we had a simpler model before, which wasn't test driven, but used test data. This one was more test driven. Um, and then for active case finding, we characterized, um, we, used, we drew on previous contributions from a previous decade on the effectiveness of testing in finding people in the population, which, which posited sort of a, a, a common sense model that if you increase test volumes, you tend to find more people. Uh, you increase test volume per capita, you tend to find more people, but if you double, you don't tend to fully double the number of people you find, et cetera. And um, it has actually a, a quite, quite nice feature we don't have time to go into, but it's, it's documented um, in this, uh, this reference here. It was originally used for us with, with chlamydia. Um, and, um, and that was used for active case finding. Now, why do we distinguish between the two? Well, it's not only that different things drive them, but, um, but active case finding is different because it drains different stocks. It, it reaches people at different stages. And one of its most valuable components, of course, is that it can diagnose someone. It can lead someone to be diagnosed. This is diagnosed area, this is diagnosed area, whereas these are undiagnosed individuals. Um, these are diagnosed. Um, these are unfortunately passed away. But um, uh, active case finding 
can identify people who are not yet uh, infective or in early stages of uh, pre-symptomatic infection. And, uh, and even those who are oligopausy or, or asymptomatic, um, uh, oligopausy symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, and as such, it can, it can sort of uh, drain those um, um, out uh, into, but by draining them down, reduce contact patterns. And in our model, we had a lowered contact rate for individuals who are diagnosed than individuals who are undiagnosed. Um, and there were some stochastic components, which at this time, and I think later, had to do with the, the efficacy of active case finding, the fraction of cases that are non-hospitalized that are reported, um, uh, and, and, and the, the fraction with people, uh, right, that are reported. Um, uh, the fraction, uh, this, uh, the fraction that are hospitalized within some range uh, is a pretty tight range, as I recall. And then um, the transmission rate um, over time, reflecting so changes in social distancing. So there was a test-driven model. And the point is, when I show these things, these all are, are combined to be compared against data. So um, you don't have to worry about all the details of this, but the, the gist of it is that that the model has all these different places within it um, that are the dock at some level with data that can be used to compare with data. And in some cases like um, travel related cases um, uh, are, are actually driven by data. And there's a bit of that with active, uh, active case finding. Um, not gonna go through this, we've, we've, we've seen this before. Um, uh, but you know the, what came out of this is sort of use of this model for a set of different purposes for our stakeholders. Um, uh, PHEC was very interested in the first of those and, and made use of it particularly, they were particularly interested because it would identify the size of the undiagnosed population in different, um, in different jurisdictions. And they were interested in projection forward in the size of the hospitalized populations from those projection regimes. Um, um, and as I said, Cheyenne and I spent a lot of time with this dashboard and any logic monitoring model performance against um, empirical data and tuning it um, and, um, and, and, and adjusting the sizes of random walks and the, um, the uh, dispersion parameters, et cetera. A lot of that was initially run on our desktops, but um, oops, but soon enough it, um, well, in by, I don't know, six months out, we had it running on, on um, remote computers. Uh, I think this was from about April, maybe April, 2020. It was very early on, we had it running. Another thing we did was projection forward. And th this, this whole presentation is from summer 2020. So it's a little bit impoverished in this regard, but um, you know, we, we would run it forward and, and of a special interest was the evolution of health system quantities, particularly for PHAC, but, but, uh, but most notably, most centrally for our provincial partners. Um, uh, so I was, I was paid out of uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority and I was formally reporting to um, the uh, Ministry of Health and the Health Authority. And um, uh, as part of this modeling, one of the key needs they were interested in was triggering surge capacity and you know, understanding of, um, of uh, capacity utilization um, concerns going forward. Um, so utilization of ICU, utilization of hospital wards. And so every day when we would run this, we would run projections forward. And they would project forward the uh, hospital census and ICU census. Um, so that, that would reflect capacity utilization and then capacity demand in the form of um, um, uh, presentation for care for both hospital and ICU. These were key needs, but also of interest was um, new infections. I mean, this was of central interest, I should say. Um, you know, how would the number of people being infected grow or change in the next, uh, next few weeks? based on the latest data 
based on the latest patterns we see in contract rates, in case finding, in um, in the um, the number of people who are susceptible, et cetera. Um, so uh, the model was was used uh, very heavily for for both understanding the current state and very notably there is the effective reproductive number. Um, uh, many, the vast majority of effective reproductive number estimates that are out there would just use nominal cases. They would not take into account testing. They would assume that all people who are infective are in fact reported. Uh, and in a world where you know early on by late spring or early summer 2020, we knew 40% of individuals roughly were, um, were asymptomatic or oligo or pouty symptomatic. Um, we really wanted uh, a measure that was more reliable than this, and which wouldn't be thrown off by active case finding efforts that bolster the number of cases, but are actually causes for success, not reflective of a growth in effective reproductive number. So we were using this, small, this um, approach, protocol filtering and protocol MCMC for effective reproductive number um, estimation by I think May 2020 as a as a better alternative than what you see um, through purely statistical analyses, which have all sorts of assumptions associated with them, including those that I've mentioned. And they assume a certain simple, simple model structure. That's something I teach in other courses. And um, it's, um, you know, it's very, very, very simple, simple model and um, simplistic model in, in, in this case. So we had better estimates, but also a, a key interest was in day-to-day um, um, -day risk uh, in municipalities or regions um, as characterized by health system and wastewater data, for example. So what's called the force of infection, um, that's what's uh, shown here. So to the risk someone would have circulating in the community per day risk of, of getting infected. And another key thing was the number of undiagnosed infectives. You know, they were always wondering, um, you know, is there a bomb that's going to be blowing up here? Are we, are we simply under, we're not simply finding people fast enough and there's going to be a, you know, explosion of cases. And um, these sorts of reasoning turned out to be extraordinarily helpful in community outbreak analysis, um, in uh, waves like particularly the Delta wave um, and the first winter wave. Uh, these were very, very helpful to interpret the situation. They also demonstrated health dis uh, disparities that resulted from things like uh, social determinants of health because of high crowding levels in some communities, we would see um, real differences in what the model was finding and could work to quantify those, translate those to medical health officers on the ground who could, um, could whose, whose uh, actions could be informed by them. The wastewater ended up playing a really important role and valuable role. I think today it's, um, it's even of, of more critical importance because of um, the lack of testing um, uh, on, a, on a major scale. Um, and it'll be interesting to know as cases likely blow up in the fall or that the winter, this coming winter with waning immunity, um, you know, if, if we'll be relying on wastewater. If so, this model will shine compared to other, um, other um, alternatives. So the model served as this tool for understanding all these different aspects of the current situation you know, force of infection, number of undiagnosed infectives, effective reproductive number. And these were reported daily um, out. And when wastewater uh, was available for us to incorporate, it provided very important grounding. Um, uh, projection forecasting was important. Another thing we did a little bit of, but we didn't, we didn't um, tap to its full capacity, I think, was backcasting. Um, and here, the idea is um, to be able, to, like in a, in a hidden Markov model, you can use data from only up to this point, or you can retrospectively use data back that came 
so if you want to understand what was the case, say a month ago, you can use data before that to inform that understanding from the from in hindsight, but you can also use data that came after that. It stands to reason. I mean, if you want to know what happened a month ago, you could consider what happened prior to a month ago, but you'd be leaving money on the table because um, uh, you know, if, if you want to know what happened a month ago and three weeks ago, you know there was a giant outbreak, that tells you a lot about what was the situation a month ago. Um, what came later also tells you a lot about what was going on there. And if you have the luxury of having that information, looking back retrospectively, this is backcasting, you can often get a better picture of what was happening at that time, um, including things like how many undiagnosed infectives were there, or what was the force of infection really in retrospect, or what was the, um, uh, what was the effective reproductive number at that time. The final thing we did, which was um, less used for this model, we did some of it, was what if questions. Um, you know, again, having it grounded and using it to ask questions about the impacts of, um, of certain types of interventions involving masking, et cetera. The reason that that wasn't tapped to its full capacity was that we had a just stupendous agent based model which if any of you come to my boot camp in August on agent-based and hybrid modeling, you'll hear about Wade. This is like Wade's creation. And it's, it's close. This model is close to miraculous that Xiaoyan and, and I mean, I was, I was involved in too many men. Basically every night I worked till past midnight for the first six months or something on this. And Xiaoyan was working alongside me. Um, but Wade did absolutely stupendous work with the ABM. And um, that architecture he put into place in February, March, 2020, before the pandemic started even, I think he had started work on that, that has lasted till this day. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, it's the richest ABM model of COVID-19 around. And I say that familiar with others like Covisim and et cetera, uh, which are available elsewhere and the work that goes on, very impressive work at Imperial, et cetera. It is, it is a, a fantastic creation and it's being used for decision-making day-to-day right now, not so much by the Ministry of Health, but the SHA and being used by the Australian Capital Territory. But um, because that other model existed, the ABM, um, it, it handled most what-if questions. Um, uh, we tried to inform that some with this model, with the uh, particle filter model. There was uh, quite a bit of back and forth learning between them, but um, a lot of the what if needs were, the, the vast majority of the what if needs were taken up by the ABM model instead, um, which could operationalize the what if questions in much greater detail. Um, one thing that I'm not talking about here, and I probably should, was um, there were actually um, several, um, uh, several versions of this model that uh, we ran. And um, so we had a, an aggregate one, like for a jurisdiction at a time, um, Saskatchewan, for example. And then we had regional ones. Um, so these would be used for multiple regions of the province. Um, and we varied between four and seven regions of the province. Um, there's an age structured one. And in fact, Jalen has done some great work um, refining that and bringing it to the Omicron era. And, um, uh, and then there's actually an age and region structured one um, that um, is additionally available. Uh, those require more particles, but they are, um, they are very effective. Um, and um, as I had noted, we ran it. I think it was this was used. This model was used for seventeen different reporting, you know, reporting for seventeen different jurisdictions, essentially. Um, um, particle filtering um, um, is, you know, a, a ideal tool for this. Uh, it um, it's well suited to work with public health data streams and stochastic models. Um, um, Particle filtering performs really well at, at, at different levels of analysis. Um, 
we apply to national, regional, local levels, local uh, communities in our north uh, to inform community partnership efforts, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and to help try to motivate um, action in terms of, 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 of mitigating community risk. Um, application of particle filter was not a turn the crank. It, it does involve iteration and learning. And you know, for until about mid-summer, late summer um, 2020, Shayan and I were really highly, highly involved in tuning this. There was a lot of um, it was while we were building it. We were flying the airplane while we were building it. New data was coming in. We really wanted certain types of data, like on passive case finding versus active that we were really hoping for but didn't get there um and um and it was a it was it was a very um uh, extraordinarily um high intensity sort of activity to try to answer um the decision making needs day to day um uh and uh we had a reporting pipeline um that um it supported it very well and by the end of the reporting pipeline, due to the work of people like Eric, Eric Redekop, Vyam, Lugia, um, what um, it, the amount of work that it took to maintain these models day to day, to actually instantiate them with the new data and to get them going, was uh, quite quite um, low. And really, it involved going and obtaining the data through secure um, systems from PHAC or or through um, uh, through the SHA, um, the health authority here. Um, I, I said here, gosh, this is this is ancient. Tens of thousands of part. No, 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 no. Later, we found really, particularly with the um, the model that was regional, we needed seventy five thousand or more particles to really get highly reliable. For the aggregate model, we did okay with tens of thousands, but I prefer to to deal with with more than that. Um, so. Um, this work was, uh, in my view, exceptionally effective. It um, addressed key needs and was was circulated every day to, even with just our province, hundreds and hundreds of of um, of, of people from MHOs to um, uh, to you know the chief medical health officer to uh, to clinicians to. Um, uh, to those involved in the ministry, et cetera. And uh, across the country, I, I, I can only guess how many thousands um, would would use these sort of results. Anyway, that's um, a little bit of a glimpse of our COVID-19 modeling. I'm glad to answer uh, any questions people may have about that. Um, um, I've, I've given sort of the Coles Notes versions, but maybe that gives you some idea of, of what went on here with these models. and um, the role they played within our uh, province. Anyone want to ask a question? Glad to answer any. How do you compare the model uh, with the PIPM model used for COVID? Um, um, thanks. Um, this is a uh, a very different um, need. So. Um, you know, PIPM is suitable for very coarse grained characterization. Um, and uh, for, for doing particle filtering, um, it's, it's not going to be a, a tool that I would, I would wanna use um, in that context. Um, could it be used in that context? Yeah, um, it, it could be. Um, um very likely because it's in python and and you could you could potentially use it that way but um i think it would be extraordinarily awkward and you know one thing i know as a computer scientist and as an engineer is um you really want to use the right tools for the job and um i mean i felt the tools we were using were quite good we did upgrade our tool set subsequently so we have a we started in AnyLogic, and most of our work was conducted in AnyLogic, but we were investing all the time in the infrastructure. And now we have a framework that's about 10 times the speed of AnyLogic. Um, 
and will allow for vastly larger particle sizes. So it's been run with particle sizes in, in that, that are uh, up to a million and can support much better disaggregation. And it's much actually, um, in the end, a better, it, it offers more flexibility in terms of some evolution and so on. The anti-logic model ended up getting quite crufty, as we say, over time. And I, I don't think PyPM is, uh, you know, for this sort of particle filtering work, PyPM would not be a suitable tool. Um, um, just as if I were to do agent-based modeling, I, I wouldn't want to do an R or something. It would it would be um, it would be like using a, you know trying to trying to use a, a saw for a to to drive in a screw or something. It would be horrible. Um, so I um, I think it's a matter of picking the right tool for the job. Any logic was pretty good. It allowed us to get started very nimbly, quickly, and um, get it going. But in the end, we ended up um, putting into place a really high performance version. Um, and, um, you know, it's capable of using things like uh, what are called GPUs to really accelerate it if we wanted to do so. Lucia has shown speed ups of dozens to over a hundred times with GPUs. Um, these graphical processing units that are traditionally used for, you know, games and, and horrible crypto mining and stuff like that, but which can be used for for these purposes, um, um, I, I wouldn't want to do it. in from what I, the limited amount I've seen from PyPM, I, I just don't think it's the right tool for the job for this sort of work. PyPM uh, seems, as, as best my group has looked at it, it seems kind of suitable for some simple exploration and so on. But there's a lot of tools out there which are good for kind of simple exploration. But when you need to to run things at an industrial level, they break down. Um, any logic does scale quite quite well to the industrial level needs here, but even it, we found, you know, it's like a booster rocket. If if maybe this, maybe maybe few of you are of my age to remember this, but the old Saturn V rockets that put astronauts on the moon from the U.S. You know, they had several stages, and you would you would have a booster stage would get you to a certain altitude, and then the next stage would take off and then the next stage yet. And um, and I, I kind of consider any logic goddess, you know, it was, it was the best tool for the first year for sure. But after that, um, we, we want to switch to a tool that would support greater performance. And that's really important because it allows, scientifically it allows for, um, for, for progress. And I, I, I just got to show you folks um, uh, a, um, one, one, um, one, um, comic, uh, that, um, that struck me so vividly, uh, during this time. Um, so you have to recognize this work with particle filtering, um, uh, was something which, um, uh, was, um, breaking boundaries um, uh, uh, at all levels. And um, I, I don't think the health system, um, uh, you know, nearly <laughs> appreciated that we were scientifically breaking ground. We were, you know, we were breaking ground in terms of the engineering of it. Um, we were doing things that had never been done with particle filtering and putting in place this you know, this infrastructure to allow it to be done on an industrial scale and automated and, and, you know, discovering things about how to tune these models, which were quite groundbreaking. Um, uh, and, and uh, a fellow colleague who was the chief, um, chief health officer for the SHA, acting chief uh, health officer for the SHA, um, sent me this, um, sent me this cartoon at, at one point where there's, you know, <laughs> there's a figure who you can match with my face um, um, using about, you know, the incredible, incredible contribution that's been accomplished. You know, I think we did more in, in two months than I could have thought we could have done in a year because it was just as such a dedicated team with Lu Jia in this particular project with Lu Jia and, and Xiao Yan, 
um, particularly, but us all working. Remember conversations at 2 a.m. And, you know, we just like nailed these problems that we have been uncertain about and solve scientific uh, questions uh, about the use of particle filtering with certain type of data. And, you know, in academia, that would have been uh, worth its weight in gold. But, you know, this is business, but it's, <laughs> it's really, it's really in the health system, you know, um, basically asking, you know, hey, Nate, can you, um, can you go uh, help our help our IT system work better with our new phones, you know, um, um, that, that was the sort of uh, types of requests we would get. Um, there's, uh, there's not, you know, at the end of the day, it's about delivery of value to save lives. Um, and then some, you know, some politics, unfortunately, that got in the way. And, um, and you know, the fact is um, what was accomplished was astounding. What Xiao Yan contributed and Lucha contributed was was just unbelievable and more than I ever would have thought possible. But um, it um, it was not something that you know was was all uniformly recognized throughout the health system in the um, the human theater of the the health system. And I'm not going to complain, but um, but I I do like to occasionally note that. Um, you know, we had to solve essentially three types of barriers, scientific barriers, engineering barriers, and communication and understanding barriers, arguably four. Um, and um, I think much of the reasons for the success of this project were actually in the, in the um, human sphere. It was in the human theater. Um, with me being in the health authority, I spent a huge amount of time, you know, translating the results of this work in terms that others could understand and um, explaining particle filtering, explaining the interpretations, explaining why particle filtering is, is, is seeing a situation a certain way. And that was very good experience because it actually clued me into the need for certain tools that would ease that process, that would ease that explanation, ease that translation, make it more explicable what's going on. Would, would the tool, the particle filtering is actually very well suited to that because it has a theory that can be explained. But um, beyond that, you want a way of sort of quickly um, um, investigating certain aspects of the situation to, to, to allow you to arrive at that good explanation. And there's computational tools we can use for that. So there's a question, do we use R? I mean, R is central to our group. Um, best program to use for particle filtering. Um, particle filtering can be conducted in a number of platforms. Um, and um, there is uh, support for particle filtering um, through three, three or four different um, lines of, of work um, or line, types of programs. Um, one of them would be um, statistical programs that are focused on, on sort of high-powered computational statistics. And um, 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 POMP is one of them, and, and there are several others that I could, I'll see if I can, um, could write down a list that I could contribute. Um, these are aimed at sort of computational statistics, and um, and and they can support particle filtering um, with an asterisk. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, there are R packages for doing particle filtering. Um, uh, I believe Julia supports it these days. Um, Julia is a up and coming language which we use in our lab. R, we're very we use R extensively. Python extensively too. Um, uh, and, but then Julia is a very attractive language for some of our work and is, is used by a lot of computational statisticians. And, and um, that is some support for particle filtering and particle MCMC, I think. Um, and finally, you know, we, we have begun a lot of our work with, with, uh, with any logic. And I don't, Regret that I, th I actually think any logic is a very nimble platform for visually having visually ex um, explicable models 
uh, in this area where you can visualize the um, the distributions quite nicely and and interact with it and uh, can quite easily build the models and and use templates to to aid that process that we'll be providing to you. So I think any of those would uh, would would do pretty well. The the real trick here is um, and and here's the thing. Um, and it's something you'll run into with, um, with uh, POMP and, and, and the, the POMPs of the world, the kind of uh, computational statistics ones that have particle filtering, um, and with um, ones that are based on um, in R, is a lot of particle filtering is not done with um, simulation models of this sort. Um, and if you want to have a simulation model that is a, um, let's say a compartmental model, um, they don't make that process easy. That's what's really easy in any logic. Um, and it's not too hard in, in what I understand of Julia's abilities in this regard, although my knowledge there is, is far more shallow. But in any logic, you can very readily build up a simulation model and particle filter it, um, at least a, a system dynamics one, a compartmental one. Um, and it supports that very nicely in a particle filtering sort of way. Whereas that's not something that POMP or, or the R-based particle filtering beyond that um, really tried it to greatly ease. You can do it. It's just, um, it requires kind of um, sacrificing the, um, the transparency of the model formulation and any logic, you know, it's a, it's a graphical stock and flow model, um, whereas that's not going to be the case in these other platforms. And so it'll lack a, a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, of, of obvious applicability. But I have had student projects under me, like in the fields course I taught this past year, which, um, which do um, particle filtering and particle MCMC. Um, within these packages and, and do quite well. So I'll see if I can get some references to these packages. Um, um, yeah, I mean, if we couldn't use any logic, um, well, our group would, would just, I mean, we have our own package for it. We, again, for most of our work these days, once the model is built, test it out, we test it, we build it, we test it out, we make sure it's working well, we tune it in any logic, and then we put it in another platform that's not on any logic. Um, and that's how a lot of computational statisticians work. They, they build it up in one language like R and then they take it out of that and they write it in C and use it. And that's what we do. Um, we, we write it in C. It could be written in Julia alternatively. But um, for performance reasons, we, we put it outside of any logic. If I couldn't have any logic at all, I'd, I'd just do it in C. But, um, but I do think POMP, um, probably the, the POMP type um, systems, and there's a couple of them, are um, are probably the best bet if if I had to uh, if I if I couldn't just write it in C and I, I didn't have any logic um, I would say yeah I would I would go do it um, in one of these one of these uh, computational statistics packages and those are pretty good and and so on they are slower I mean one of the reasons that we do it. Um, uh, do it and see is just it's um, it's faster and um, and, and that's something which uh, allows us to to you know have more particles and 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 run it um, with with a faster learning loop uh, et cetera. So um, yeah, that's um, I, I, those are some some comments on that front. Let's see. Um, uh, Retweaking the model, um, um, changing guidelines in the dwindling of obligatory pathway. Um, would I retweak the model? Um, oh, the model has wastewater in it. I the wastewater I figured I, I featured yesterday. Um, so the wastewater essentially like that's a central part of our of our modeling these days, and um, it is an absolutely key part. Um, uh, our work incorporated wastewater as of late 2020, and it's been a central part of our analytics since then. 
and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, I, I consider it probably the single most important data source. Um, now, um, uh, you know, it's true that like the active case finding isn't nearly as important there. Um, well, uh, the truth is, um, I mean, I, I have a fairly negative view of, of what's likely to come this coming year. Um, uh, I think the writing is very clearly on the wall. I don't want this to, to dominate um, the discussion, but uh, my own perspective following COVID-19 day to day and, and uh, talking weekly with fellow lead modelers from around Canada, um, uh, I think it's a fair thing to say that, um, uh, that a lot of us uh, have a fairly dim view of, of um, the next year. Um, I think we're going to have a great summer by and large, even with B4 and B5 and B2.1.12.1. But I think we're going to um, have a hard uh, winter. And the primary reason is waning of immunity. Um, immunity is just not long lasting. And particularly with new variants coming in, it is even shorter lasting. And it lasts longer against hospitalization, but I think we're going to have hospital crises. Our hospitals here have just gotten out of crisis mode. It came this close to breaking them. We had to fly people to Ontario during the the um, uh, during the Delta wave, and it was worse than that in the Omicron wave. And we called all of those, you know, four months ahead of time. Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, right now we're, we're fairly well suited in terms of uh, support. The, the real burden right now is, is a lot of it is on long COVID and mental health issues. Um, um, but there's huge burdens that have been generated by the hospitals being full with COVID patients, not just those with COVID, but for COVID as well. And um, that's blocked, you know, many elective surgeries, many. Um, uh, many appointments for chronic disease, et cetera. And that's rippling through the system. And we're involved in quite a bit of modeling for that. Uh, I think that next winter, it'll, it'll be a very interesting case. And, and there's some, some different perceptions going on about the immunodynamics, but the current situation is, you know, we're, we have fairly strong immunity, but immunity wanes, even in 10 weeks, immunity against infection, wanes very notably to in the Omicron era. Um, but uh, even against um, uh, hospitalization, there's big waning over the course of, of a year. And we have not gotten enough people boosted to really protect you know, um, uh, through, the, uh, through the end of next year very, very well. And I tend to have a fairly pessimistic view that our hospitals are going to be overrun again. And I've seen it before. I've seen it twice now. Uh, I have had colleagues die from it. Uh, and I mean, die from other conditions because they can't get care because it is chock-a-block full of COVID patients. And um, I'm, I'm of the view that, you know, already a lot of the waning, a lot of the immunity that has come from the um, vaccinations that went on, the two doses, that most people got by last summer, a lot of that immunity against uh, hospitalization has waned by this point. And, um, and by, by late fall, uh, people who have gotten their third or fourth doses will be fairly well off as long as there's not a highly immune evasive variant that comes in. But the more we look at it, BA4, BA5, even more immune evasive, um, BA2.12.1, um, quite bad in these regards. And, um, you know, the animal studies right now are suggesting, uh, and they're imperfect, but they are suggesting a shift towards higher virulence. Um, this, uh, these bugs have, um, with B.4 and B. BA.4 and B.5, they've, you know, almost maxed out their transmittivity. I mean, they're like measles now. It's just incredibly transmissible. And the route to go, for uh, being able to spread more um, is uh, quite clearly immune evasion. And there's some indication that virulence is picking up as well. Um, and uh, the, the immunological evidence on this is mixed at the moment. Um, 
but I, I strongly suspect we're going to be dealing with a uh, very bad wave where the public is not going to respond, the ministries are not going to respond, and the immune systems are going to be waned. People are going to think they're protected and they ain't protected very well. And we're going to get a lot of people going to the hospital, few dying, but a lot of people going to the hospital at, at such a level that we're going to be uh, in bad shape. So do I think active case finding it could be left out of the model now? Well, I think it'll have to be put in. So I would, I would just um, not emphasize it as much right now, but I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a, another big show. Um, and I don't know if it'll be up to, to par with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually worried. I, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more with the, uh, yeah, the KT issues are going to be huge. And, um, uh, and, you know, Paxlovid um, is, a, in my mind, Paxlovid is a very important therapeutic tool to keep people out of hospital. Um, um, it, it is arguably, it, it may be important for, for the other side of this that I'm not talking about, that occupies so much of my focus, which is long COVID. And, and gosh, if that's going to, I mean, that is going to cause one serious demand for health system, um, health system needs. We're seeing that already in our data. Um, and, and the fact is that um, while Omicron is somewhat less likely on a per person basis to lead to need for, or to development of long COVID, it is, um, it is regrettably uh, something where if a lot more people are infected, you know, a lot more people will need need care for long COVID. It, the chance may be half of what it is for, you know, for um, Delta and before, but um, if three times as many people get it, you're still have more people with long COVID. And, you know, this is an area where we have extensive evidence from uh, longitudinal data collection now. And uh, it is a very serious situation where a lot of people are not nearly getting the care that they need and where there'll be a lot of health system demand there. Paxlovid, therefore, could be useful for heading off long COVID. Paxlovid is, um, um, uh, if, you know, in terms of stopping spread is, is limited because it requires, you know, people to take it earlier in their course and it requires people to present for it right now and to be at a level of, 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 cons a level of, of uh, severity or, um, you know, of concern uh, um, that they can get it. If it could be broadened a lot and, you know, many people could get it proactively beforehand rather than waiting to, to have a, a physician triage them um, to figure out if they're entitled to it, um, et cetera. I think it could be a really important instrument for them to take early as soon as rapid antigen tests um, test positive. Personally, I think we should have a, a whole system for calling in rapid antigen tests that would allow for distributed testing and then could use that data for, for surveillance understanding. But that's, uh, I'm not seeing any movement towards that whatsoever. Um, uh, yeah, so um, just more comments here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Paxlovid is, is a fantastic drug. It's holding up very well in the Omicron context. Um, it lowers the viral load level hugely, lowers just like um, hearts, right? Uh, highly active antiretrovirals for HIV. It lowers the, it, the, um, uh, the viral load so much, it reduces risk of transmission and r reduces the severity, although there's that you know, post-Paxlovid bump that's been noted um, uh, now well-established. And um, uh, I, think, I think it is extremely important. I'm, I'm also reasonably hopeful that maybe we'll get, you know, um, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, Omicron boosters, or at least Omicron boosters um, uh, by the fall. But the real issue is uptake as far as I'm concerned. I, you know, I'm just not seeing many people getting boosted. And, and I mean, the, the public health data is not, not really that encouraging there about the level of uptake of boosting without the Good public health messaging. Um, um, yeah, I agree completely. The formulation of vaccines um, needs an upgrade. And, you know, I'm hoping there's going to be a pan coronavirus, pan sarcovirus, um, 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 you know, vaccine that will eventually come out, but that's not around the corner, it's, you know, further, further out. Yeah, schools of public health have dropped masking requirements. Yeah. Uh, 
Mm. Um, I, you know, I think masking is a no brainer. I think it's yeah, yeah, like, like, yes, mask. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're in a, in a, in a, particularly in a, in a public sphere with, um, with, with lots of unknown parties, of course, mask. Um, um, but um, I understand, and, and you know, all of us don't like, don't like, don't. I mean, it's not a pleasant thing, right? Um, but, but um, it really is important, and I think we need to learn from other cultures where masking is is just a part of social norms if you're sick or or if you're concerned about getting getting sick for, for loved ones uh, case or whatever where masking is just accepted and very well accepted in all contexts and i do think that you know masking masking requests by institutions organizations um and in a certain municipal context like mass transit and so on may you know, may, may make a big difference. One of the things that most troubles me about the winter is going to be, um, you know, that the public is just thinks it's beyond this. And they think that because they got their two doses, they're, you know, they're fine. And there is some evidence that people have compensatory behavior. If they get vaccinated, they may, they may be engaging in more and types of behavior they wouldn't have otherwise, and which may lessen the effects of their vaccination and protecting them and protecting others. Um, and a lot of people, of course, because of those who do have significant residual immunity are getting um, um, asymptomatically infected in a way that still allows them to spread it, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, the long COVID situation is profoundly serious. Um, I, I cannot overstate you know, the, the level of concern I have about that mental health wise, um, uh, you know, importantly, but also, um, you know, also in terms of, uh, uh, of, of quality of life, of, of ability to participate in, um, in, in, in activities of daily living, um, uh, health system demand, um, what, what we're seeing is, is really, really serious. And we're also seeing evidence that each time someone's infected, it may get, you know, the, the chance of developing the long COVID or the extent of the long COVID may get worse. Um, and the severity of symptoms may, may actually get worse, even if they're you know, far separated. And of course, we're dealing with an infect reinfection regime now where you know, we can expect people to get reinfected. And the point is their residual immunity, natural immunity, while it provides some degree of protection, it's less strong than vaccination and it and it seems that it's a, it adds to the damage and risk of long COVID in ways that could be very troubling. Uh, and it may lead to reactivation of long COVID symptoms in, in ways that could be uh, very deleterious. I'm you know, very, very, very concerned about that. And it's for reasons that I see day to day with our data from our lung, lung cohort patients. Um, yeah, large, I, the inequity side is the most it's one of the most troubling things. Um, this is something I haven't spoken much about in in this boot camp, but it's so central to many areas of our work. And um, uh, the truth is um, the methods we're talking about here used well can be used to help illuminate and 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 help um, motivate action to address health inequities. But um, uh, you know, I think, uh, the burden of the pandemic and long COVID in particular are unquestionably following, falling on, um, uh, on more vulnerable groups um, for many reasons, um, more likely to get COVID, less likely to be quickly diagnosed or treated for it, but less likely to have ready access to vaccination or to have gotten vaccinated, um, all of which put them at disadvantage and risk with long COVID, more likely to have underlying conditions, um, um, like diabetes, which is a potent contributor as, as um, Institute for Systems Medicine in Seattle has found um, one of the four major sort of predictors for, for long COVID together with Epstein-Barr virus, uh, um, et cetera. And, um, and then, uh, you know, individuals who, who get long COVID uh, in that group are even less likely to be able to secure effective care for it. Um, and uh, or get time off, et cetera. So, um, you know, you're seeing 
tremendous risk. And of course, individuals in that in the in the vulnerable groups are more likely to have to work, you know, in essential jobs, frontline jobs, jobs that don't afford them um, uh, much protection against subsequent infection. So we're dealing with um, what could be, uh, if not a perfect storm, a very very bad storm of of, of sort of uh, you know health inequities. Um, with very high burden of long COVID, um, you know, hitting a health system which is barely still standing here after after the Delta and the Omicron waves, um, and is really really struggling with burnout and and um, you know overload, uh, et cetera, and huge backlogs of patient needs. So we are in one one pickle right now, and yeah, U.S. I can only imagine what. You know what we're what we're dealing with there. Um, it's 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 quite uh, quite horrendous. So um, anyway, I'm I'm gonna stop my comments there. I, I did promise I'd try to give a, a bit of a glimpse of our COVID nineteen work, and I know that came out as somewhat fragmented, but I hope it's uh, it's helpful. And um, I'm glad if the the comments are are helpful. I'm updating my understanding day to day, and it is a time of uncertainty. I will tell you there there is a subset of my colleagues who think that um, um, uh, that you know it's more hopeful, um, and that you know repeated. Um, so, uh, one of the areas which Wade has modeled uh, wonderfully, together with um, faculty uh, member, two faculty members now at at University of Alberta, Alex Doroshenko and um, Ellen Rafferty. They've, mesh, they've uh, modeled um, uh, chickenpox and, and varicella zoster virus in as much as it manifests through chickenpox and shingles. And one of the observations there is that, you know, um, uh, overall, um, preventing shingles through vaccination helps um, in the long term. It helps greatly lower the burden of shingles and greatly lower the burden because people aren't infected in the first place and greatly lower the burden of chickenpox. So if you can if you can vaccinate for varicella zoster, you know, in the long term, you spared people two real scourges, chick uh, chickenpox early in life by and large and, and shingles later in life. But one of the things that um, there's lent credibility is, is that um, if people are infected early on in life through varicella zoster, chicken pox, um, it often sticks around in the body, much as herpes does or other other infections, um, uh, through much of the life, and and then it you know reemerges as shingles. And one of the things that keeps it down is exposure, exposure to other infections, which activate the immune system and cause it to be able to be extra vigilant against. You know, it multiplies the complement of um, of T cells to fight against chickenpox and so on, and fight against varicella zoster, and and that can keep shingles less likely. So there is, there are one or two of my colleagues who say, um, you know, uh, that it it's not a bad thing if people are exposed continually to COVID infection because it may keep our immune systems primed. So when it comes to any sort of risk of a wave, you know, maybe we'll get infected, but it'll be so mild that it, because we're, all our immune systems are constantly primed by some exposure to it, it'll be, it'll be mild after that. And um, that is a hopeful theory. Um, uh, the, the evidence that I've seen is not awfully supportive of that in the sense that Omicron-based immunity tends to be very short-lived. And this factor of, Successive infections tend to worsen effects in terms of long COVID, and Omicron can result in, albeit lower risk of long COVID, it's still very significant. Um, uh, th there is that thought that maybe, maybe we'll be, you know, well protected just by being primed all the time, and I, um, I don't think that's likely, but I can't rule it out, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope that is the case, and you know this. This goes in a happy direction, but the other thing that's conspiring there is, you know, new variants are coming up, and and they're coming up again because of inequities, right? Um, and and individuals um, living with COVID for long periods of time because of immuno immunosuppressive state, where 
who haven't been able to clear it don't have access to Paxlovid, et cetera, and, and so on. I, I wish, um, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. COVID brings to light the very reactive state of our health system and the fact that it's not really not a health care system, it's a disease care system in many ways. It tends to be very reactive. I'm being overly critical, but, but uh, I think it's, it's it, you know, Canada is, is better than some countries, but it's, it's still a lot of it is a disease care system. And, um, and it's also uh, a system for whom COVID has is, is really identified just how easily people fall into cracks between sectors, right? And particularly with mental health issues, substance use issues, domestic violence issues, um, suicide prevention, how um, the criminal justice system, the, the social services system and the health system just are not dovetailing well and as a result, issues like homelessness and suicide prevention and substance use, and mental health, often, you know, they 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 fall through the cracks and people are not there's not that service integration. I, you know, I think COVID has really woken us up to this. Um, and I mean, it's made it undeniable. Um, it's made it so undeniable that policymakers can't even you know can't easily deny it. Um, and I'm. I'm, I'm recently hopeful that that will cause at least some experimentation with whole person stabilization mechanisms, et cetera. But it's, you know, I, I think it's gonna um, require um, some change thinking. And honestly, to bring it back to the goals of the boot camp, I think a lot of what we're talking about here, um, particularly these broad models, um, in informing models and data with data and not being afraid of areas which are under evidence by direct measure ends. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's a big part of having the boldness to move on these other areas which are underserved. Um, uh, and frankly, it, it comes back, you may remember my, the first day I showed this, this, this cartoon, a far side cartoon of this Viking ship where, you know, all the strong rowers were on one side and weaklings like me were on the other. And, and, you know, they couldn't figure out why they were going around in circles. We're going around in circles in our, you know, in our, in our health systems in part because of tremendous imbalances and not putting the balances in the social determinants of health, the upstream factors that drive them, not putting them in the community and, and putting all these investments in flashy new, you know, acute care facilities and expanding the size of our waiting rooms and or our uh, ERs only to have them fill up um, and not not really dealing with the imbalances that lead to there being more people coming in than leave or 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 lead to people developing conditions that needn't otherwise be developed or inability to get discharged, et cetera. The lack of services again in the community being underserved. And yet like like the, the proverbial man searching for his keys only in the light, because we don't have data on those other areas of the system, they're under, you know, they're under, um, under attended to. Um, we don't have data on them because they're less invested in, and we invest in them less because we don't have data on them. Um, and it's a really sad thing. If we build models that are integrative and we recognize the data about one area of the system is influenced by things going on across the entire system. Some of these methods we're talking about here can shed light on what's going on over there, much as what we saw in, COVID, in measles cases and chickenpox cases illuminated this hidden contact structure of the population. We can get pictures of what's going on in these key upstream areas if we just have the right way to listen to it when we have data from other areas, because data is not just about that area of the system, it whispers to us about the broader areas of the system. Okay, um, so, so let's uh, pause now for 10 minutes. We'll be back and we're gonna do a big push on a couple of lines um, that will take us through the rest of the afternoon. Um, thanks, thanks very much uh, and look forward to, to chat again at half past here.